Good afternoon, everybody who's already tuned in for this week's Healthy Aging Live conversation. Um, I'm just going to fill in for a few minutes until we start with this week's guest at bang on four o'clock. So if you're already there with your cup of tea, just settle in uh, and get ready for a fantastic conversation this afternoon. If you haven't got your cup of tea, you've got a couple of minutes to get one, but don't be late. Uh, just to give you an update from Care Vision, who are the sponsors and hosts of this Healthy Aging Live conversation. As you know, if you're a regular, every week they produce video material for people to use to enable them to live well as they get older, and particularly to support people living with dementia. And I was looking back through the material that they've produced over the last, uh, well, three months or so now, uh, since the beginning of the coronavirus crisis, really, it goes back to. And there is... Um, uh, some, uh, a fantastic array of different material and I looked to see which have been the most popular, which are the ones that have been watched most often and it's quite interesting that it's quite a mixture of different programs so probably one of the most popular is the film made about the life and legacy of Judy Garland uh, called A Star Is Born and I think everyone resonates with The Wizard of Oz and Judy Garland and the, the memories that brings back and the music in that but actually coming close up behind the Judy Garland video is one called Guess the Music, which is a reminiscence activity for people with mild to moderate dementia. But in fact, all of us can enjoy it, uh, where the host, Laura Bolton, takes us through different musicals and we try and guess which are the ones we can remember and, and we know about. So that's a, a reminiscence activity. And there's a whole range of reminiscence programming on video for people to use to support them when they're living with mild to moderate dementia. Another really popular one is one I mentioned last week, one of the latest films to be produced, which is The Seven Wonders of the Modern World, which reflects the fact that the seven wonders of the world that were originally back from, from, pre, uh, from ancient times uh, have largely disappeared. I think only the, the pyramids of Giza are the ones that are still there. So um, about 50 years ago, somebody spent some time collecting a, a public opinion on what are the seven wonders of the modern world. And as I mentioned last week, three of those seven wonders of the modern world are all in the same continent, and it's not the continent I would have expected them to be. So that's a, a, a recent addition to the library. And the other one that's been very popular over the last few months is a number of videos on exercise. And these are both for people with mild to moderate dementia, but also for people with more advanced dementia. We know that exercise is incredibly important to healthy living. Uh, last week, my guest was Professor Shubi Banerjee, and he talked about the Lancet Commission report and findings on prevention, prevention of dementia. And we know that uh, in order to uh, reduce your risk of the advancement of dementia, physical exercise is a good way of staving off the advancement of dementia. So those physical exercise videos have also proved to be enormously popular over the last few months. But I'm pleased to say that one of the most popular parts of the portfolio is the healthy aging conversation. Uh, and so it's just about four o'clock. So I'm Jeremy Hughes. I'm hosting the Healthy Aging Conversations every week on the Care Visions Facebook site, available live, but also available recorded on the Facebook site and their YouTube site. And this week, my guest is Keith Oliver, a former primary school head teacher who himself is living with dementia. Uh, every month, I have make sure that one of our weekly guests is somebody with personal lived experience of dementia. I'm delighted to start September with Keith as our guest. And in the background is his wife, Rosemary, who I don't think is going to appear on camera, but it's very much, as Keith will make clear, uh, the two of them who are living with dementia, not just him. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means. But Keith, welcome to this week's Healthy Aging Conversation. What I'd like to start with, because it's always good to start on a positive note when lots of people are feeling a bit stressed and stretched by living with coronavirus, is just tell me your happiest moment from the past week. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you for that introduction. And it seems appropriate, actually, our new term starting to have a headmaster as your guest. So um, I'm delighted to be here today. Um, I suppose the, the, the happiest moment over the past week was one shared with Rosemary on Saturday when um, we, we live close by a river. And the river at the moment has become very overgrown and tangled with um, reeds and weed and just lush vegetation. And for some time, we've been meaning to climb into this river and clear it. And uh, like so many things in life, you, you're not looking forward to doing these things. And thinking about it was really challenging. But actually getting in there and getting stuck in, uh, we had a fabulous hour or so in the river, got absolutely soaked. The river was over our Wellingtons and we had to use a, a long ladder to get into the river. But it was, it was incredibly rewarding. 
And I suppose there's different analogies and metaphors within that story, which link to life with dementia, really. That so often thinking about some of these things is really quite intimidating and frightening and worrying. But actually, when one gets stuck in, particularly with support, and uh, Rosemary and I did this together, uh, the rewards can be um, can be very fulfilling. That's a lovely story and one that is not just positive for your own experience, but of course makes an enormous difference for people walking by the river and being able to enjoy it. And I think the, the more we do to keep nature um, in, a, in a fit state for us all to enjoy, the better. It always annoys me when people just drop litter uh, and leave it there. And I think we can all play a little part, even if it's just making sure we pick up litter or don't drop it in the first place. But you've gone a step further in cle clearing out the river. So well done for you and a, a really lovely, happy moment for you to have experienced with Rosemary. Yeah. So Keith, to start our conversation, I wanted to go back to before you were diagnosed with dementia. So I think it's almost 10 years since you were diagnosed in December. Uh, and I wondered just if you could tell me, December 2010, I was wondering if you could tell me really how, how long before that were you aware of something not being quite right that you felt needed some attention? Yes, I suppose the story really begins around about the March of 2010, where I was in, um, I was at the time working as a, a primary school advisor and advising the 23 schools in Canterbury. And I used to chair and attend meetings. And I used to look at some of these young teachers and young heads and used to think, well, that was a bit like me, you know, this guy's really sharp or this lady's really sharp and I'm not quite as good as I used to be. You know, I think I'm 54 now. I'm beginning to sort of be past my sell by date perhaps and uh, not as good as I used to be. That was one sort of indication. Didn't think any more of it. And right about that time, I also uh, experienced several falls, which were unexplained, um, walking and sitting. And my balance was becoming really quite challenging. And spatial awareness was, was becoming difficult. Simply moving around and not bumping into things was becoming difficult. And Rosemary would say, you know, you're not, you, don't, you don't seem with it all the time now. So I thought perhaps I'd got an ear infection, actually. So I went to the GP expecting to um, have that diagnosis and having some tablets to sort that out. And uh, anyway, the, 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 the GP checked my ears and there was nothing wrong there that they could see and gave me some antibiotics just in case. Told me to come back in a week, which I did. I had another fall, felt no better. She then gave me some more tests around walking heel to toe and uh, some sort of cognitive tests she began to ask me. I thought, well, that's a bit strange for someone with an ear problem, but thought no more of it. And she said, uh, I think I'm going to send you for a brain scan. Didn't tell me why. I should have asked, really, but I didn't. I was a bit scared. I don't know. So I went for the brain scan then in the April of 2010. And that came with an appointment with a neurologist in May. Uh, we went to see the neurologist. I'd got a normal day at school at the time. I was working, of course. I had a staff meeting that day and I had dinner duty and I had other things to attend to as a head teacher. So I nipped out of school for an hour with Rosemary for this appointment, saw the neurologist and was confronted by the first shock, which was that the brain scan was uh, commissioned in order to see if I'd got a brain tumour. Uh, and that hadn't been mentioned to either Rosemary or myself, I guess for fear of frightening us uh, but that clearly was what the avenue the GP was taking in case. So the neurologist said, well, the good news, Mr. Oliver, is it's not a brain tumour. First shock. Draw breath. Mm -hmm. Think about that for a moment. And then he launched straight into, but the bad news is it looks like Alzheimer's. Well, you could have knocked us down with a feather. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he, he showed us the scan. He drew pictures because scans are not easy to read mm -hmm. uh, to a lay person, but he was really good. And he drew pictures of what he described as a, a healthy, what you'd term a normal 54 year old brain. And then alongside that, he drew mine. Mm -hmm. And he introduced us to words like atrophy and he explained that the, what the scan was showing. He said it was quite conclusive, but not totally conclusive. So um, he was going to send me for some more tests. And um, he was going to uh, see me again in a month. So that's what happened. I went for more tests. And thankfully, he gave me the phone number of his secretary. Mm -hmm. And he said, if you need any help, speak to Kaylee, because she's great. Mm -hmm. 
and she was. And I guess that, Jeremy, was the first person mm. who, in this journey, came to my rescue alongside Rosemary. She was the first professional who I was able to confide in. And it taught me a lesson that I've retained since then, which is, you know, there are people out there who you can turn to, who you can lean upon, who you can uh, get help and support from. And she was my first, she was my first rock at a time when I didn't know what was going on. So um, I went back a month later, having had some more scans, I had a PET scan then, because the first one was an MRI, had blood tests, and had then a, a more an MMSE and all sorts of tests like this again, another cognitive test with this neurologist. And he said, well, it's looking more and more like Alzheimer's. Um, other things less significant to being ruled out, uh, but I'm not giving you the diagnosis. Is that I'm, I suspect it's dementia, and I think it's Alzheimer's in your case, but it could also be a bit of vascular there as well. So I'm going to now discharge you. Wow, that, that frightened me for a start. I thought, well, what's going on here? He's just told me this news, and he's telling me I've got, to, I've got discharged. So I'm going to go back to work, and I'm going to be okay, or... I started to read a few books about Alzheimer's and they weren't good news. Um, so it frightened me, the word discharge. It didn't cheer me up at all. Um, so I questioned him on that. And he said, well, what now happens is I'm now going to hand you over to the memory clinic and they'll pick you up and they'll do a more in-depth analysis with you and they'll determine, um, you know, certainly whether it is Alzheimer's or not and we'll go from there. So oh, did, thank did you very you... much. So that's quite a, a, a long, prolonged journey. All this, all the time you were carrying on working. How did you? How did you? Because a lot of people worry about what they should say to work colleagues yep. while that period when you're not quite sure whether you've got a diagnosis or not. What's your advice to people? And how did you handle the yeah. fact that you were carrying on working with colleagues in schools across what 24 schools you say across the Canterbury area? Yeah. What, when this how, how did you was... cope with that? Yeah, when this bombshell was dropped about the potential diagnosis in the May, as I said, I was, I was a normal day at school was expected there. So I rang school at lunchtime and said, I'm going to be a bit late. Um, I should be in at two o'clock. I need to see the dep two deputies, the two secretaries and um, another member of the senior leadership team. Please, can you meet me at three o'clock in my office? Didn't say why. So at three o'clock, I shared this bombshell with them. Mm -hmm. And it was only a matter of three hours or four hours after Rosemary and I had received this news. And I said, look, I drew them the same pictures the neurologist drew of my brain scan and I explained to them. And they were totally shocked. You know, they, they, they didn't see this coming at all. Um, and I then talked to them about a plan. So in those two or three hours, I was immediate, my brain was clicking into action into how I could work with these people mm -hmm. and how I could continue to run what was a very, very large school, large primary school of nearly 500 children and about 50 staff. And I wanted to run that school for longer. Mm -hmm. um, so we put in place a plan which I pinned on my notice board and hid behind timetables. And only these people in this meeting knew that was there. Right. And Rosemary used to come and pick me up at lunchtime uh, three three times a week probably just to give me a break from school and we used to go to the coast at Whistable there have a have a sandwich I'd have a sleep and try and manage this 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 process uh, and what the the disease was beginning to do to me alongside the stress and the worry of of the uncertainty of not having it absolutely confirmed so would your advice from that experience be it was the right thing to tell colleagues straight away? Because it sounds like that took quite a lot of courage because you didn't well, know how they would react. But it yeah, sounds... in, my, in my case, Jeremy, there was no option because I, I didn't want to tell parents. I didn't want to tell children. I didn't want to tell the wider staff. But in the, in the three months that followed while I was working, things began to change in the sense that the, 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 the Alzheimer's was beginning to make more of an impact upon me. And so things like the door, which had always been open to my office, was now becoming closed. Um, taking phone calls, which was becoming more challenging. Uh, cheering meetings, I was delegating more. Um, issues that needed both leadership and management were, were becoming more and more problematic. So I did need that close-knit team mm. who I'd worked with 
for, for a number of years and who I'd brought into the school over a number of years myself. So we were a close knit team and they covered my back. And so how did you how did you from that stage, how did you come to the decision to step down from your post? Uh, because that's a big decision. You know, you're you're 55 years old. You, yeah. you fully expected to carry on being a head teacher for a number of years. That's that's quite a big change, isn't it? To, to come yeah. to the conclusion that you need to step down. Tell yeah. me about that. Well, the GP had tried to get me to finish earlier um, and I'd refused. He said, I want to sign you off because I don't think you're going to manage this. I said, no, I want to keep going longer. Uh, I then had the benefit as a teacher of the summer holidays, which, like all teachers, I did work part way through, uh, but still it gave me a break. Um, and that allowed me to take stock as well. And we took a holiday during that time. So I was thinking about the new term and I went back into school, hoping to start the new term and I had two falls in school. And I thought this is this is just unsustainable. If I fell over in front of the children or staff, um, it's not something I'd wish to do. And I was getting then more appointments for more assessments. And I thought, I just can't keep this, this secret anymore and carry on working. So uh, I then went off sick in the September, um, which coincided with, with much, much more frequent investigations at the memory clinic, because I was determined not to get this diagnosis. I didn't want this diagnosis. Mm. I wanted them to find something else that perhaps was causing these problems that would allow me after perhaps two or three months off sick to return to work, but that was not in fact going to be the case. And from what you've said, there's some lessons, I think, for the NHS probably from your experience. It sounds as though it was more accident than design that you so happened to land on Kaylee, who was supportive and helpful. But does that suggest to you that that ought to be a bit more routine and a bit more automatic, that there will always be somebody there to give you support and advice? Because I remember talking to uh, Sheila Robinson on, on this programme a few weeks ago, and Sheila said that from her diagnosis, she was just sent away with nothing. Yeah. Uh, she was just was told she had dementia and told, I think, to come back in six months for, for uh, you know, another appointment. And you, you don't go away and forget about it. You, you want somebody to talk to. So Kaylee sounds very supportive, but does sound as though it was a good luck rather than careful planning. She, she was very supportive, but she wasn't. Uh, her job wasn't to support me. Mm -hmm. Her job was to support the professor who had given me the diagnosis. Um, you know, there were times when I felt guilty ringing her uh, and, you know, burdening myself upon her with my worries about appointments and about things. She wouldn't talk to me about the dementia. She wouldn't talk to me about that. She would only talk to me about the process. Right. Um, so it took some of the worry about, you know, appointments. And if a letter didn't come quickly, then she would say it's in the post, it's on its way. So it was that sort of reassurance rather than any kind of reassurance by way of signposting me. There was no signposting. Um, there was no um, support for Rosemary. Um, mm -hmm. There was no support for, you know, the actual um, working other than my, my, my senior staff. Mm. So you, you mentioned Rosemary there and you've been together for what, 40 years uh, living in Canterbury um, and um, brought up your children together. Um, what, what about the the experience for Rosemary? And it does seem that dementia it doesn't just affect the person with dementia, but it affects their partner as well. How did how did you deal with that conversation with Rosemary, and and how have you developed together as you've managed your dementia over the last decade? Yeah, I mean Rosemary was obviously his first appointment with me, and was in with all with me for all the early appointments, and most of those since then. Um, and so you know. Peter Ashley, our old friend, dear and late friend, used to say that he and his wife were two sides of the same coin. And that yeah. is so true. And what I'd add to that is that good days for me are often good days for Rosemary and bad days for me are often bad days for Rosemary, but also the reverse. So, you know, I, I care for Rosemary and she cares for me. And, um, and that, that role is interchangeable. Um, she never regards herself as my carer. She's my supporter mm -hmm. and wife, which is what she's always been. And I'm a husband and supporter. Um, and I think that that is important for us. You know, other people will see different labels as important for them. And I think that should be supported. Um, but whatever works for each individual couple and each individual person is important. And we shouldn't we shouldn't um, um, expect people mm. to fulfill labels and roles without support. Um, because but it sounds like it sounds like from what you're saying that it's important that for you it's a two-way process. There, although you're the person with dementia, you're still 
Rosemary's husband and there's still things you do for her um, and it's a two-way process it's a partnership and that, that's important to remember because when people get labeled as the carer it somehow almost negates the, the two-way relationship and makes it a dependency relationship which probably some people may be comfortable with but many won't be yeah absolutely right I couldn't say it better yeah absolutely right what about the wider family so you've got um, two, three children uh, two stepchildren and a, a child of your own from your from your marriage um, you've got grandchildren how did you go about sharing your news with the with the wider family yeah. I was determined right from the word go to speak to them in the way I spoke to the senior leadership school at, team at school so they were brought in very quickly into the loop and they were told matter-of-factly about what was going on um, and then as the diagnosis was confirmed those conversations were ratcheted up a bit and we did our power of attorney very early on and we revisited our will very early on and then we thought well that's now in place we can park it until it's required and to be honest with you Jeremy since then um, it's not been the elephant in the room mm -hmm. uh, it's been something that we've we've known about we've talked about occasionally but it's not it's not dominated and overly influenced relationships and an illustration of that is our youngest grandson who's now 12 and was what two or three when I was diagnosed he's a very very bright chap um, and he didn't he was not told by his mother until he was about nine that granddad had dementia uh, because we didn't want it to to influence and distort and uh, and take anything away from this fabulous relationship he and he and I have but it was a drip thing really he I think he picked it up earlier and, and our daughter would tell him things like, well, granddad gets tired more easily now than he mm -hmm. used to. And sometimes he's not able perhaps to remember all of what you say to him. So don't, don't get frustrated and don't get upset if granddad doesn't always remember those things. So um, it does sound like it's important to think about who you're communicating with within the family. And, and if you like, think about what it means to them and, and, and manage the communication on a one by one basis, individual to each person. Very much so, yeah. Everybody with dementia is different and unique, as indeed are all those relationships. Mm -hmm. What about, um, you mentioned a few minutes ago, good days and bad days. And I think one of the important messages for anyone living with Alzheimer's or another form of dementia is to recognise that it's not just a linear progression, that it does, we all know that it steadily gets worse over time and that's something you have to live with. But there are, as you say, Keith, good days and bad days. How do you, how do you, how do you see, how do you describe that way of living that, that recognises that. Yeah, fortunately for me, there are there are not too many really bad days as a whole. I do have them, and I had one the other day. Um, but but what tends to happen for me is I get patches. So some days will, most days will have a mixture of good and bad within them. And uh, and you know, it's like we use the analogy of the fog. And at uh, one time I'd think, well, uh, the dementia is going to cause a fog, and the fog's going to come down. When I get up in the morning and it's go not going to lift until bedtime. That doesn't happen too often thankfully but what does happen is it's like driving along a road and what I'd say to your audience is if you've driven along a road doing fog you'll know you go through patches of fog. So one minute the visibility can be quite good and then down comes the fog and the, the visibility becomes much less. Well that's what living with dementia is like. During the day I can I can have lots of experience of patches of fog, um, but other times of the day the, the, the sun shines brightly or it's it's merely you know merely cloudy. Um, but that that, that um, does sound like uh, a good message for people to remember is that it's patches of fog and if you can bear in mind that the fog does clear, that yep. it's not there forever and and have that almost in the back of your mind. It's reassuring to know that you, you, you tend to come through the fog, as uh, the analogy is a good one. You come through the fog and the sun shines again, uh, and you know there might be another patch of fog, but, it, but the fact that it's patchy is an important way of, of understanding it. That's true. And as pe people who interact with those with dementia can often be part of that lifting of the fog, or indeed at times, Jeremy, bringing down of the fog. So let me move on to your from your personal experience. One of the things and the reason really I got to know you in the first place is that uh, I suppose you could say once a head teacher, always a teacher. Uh, you've been very clear uh, in a mission, really, over the last 10 years that you want to tell more people about your experience. And you produced in, in 2016 the book Walk the, Walk the Walk, Talk the Talk, uh, and your latest book published last year, Dear Alzheimer's. What drove you to, to put pen to paper, as it were, and, and tell people about your experience? 
Well, uh, it's, I say it's a window of opportunity, really. I, I, I'm not as good cognitively now as I was, uh, say, even three or four years ago. Um, the, the writing of the book, I needed a lot of help with the typing. The book isn't ghost written. All those books are written by me. Mm. But the last one, I, I only typed about a quarter of it, probably 20 percent. The rest of it was typed by friends because now I just simply cannot manage that. Whereas before I would have done that walk the walk I did virtually on my own. Um, so you know. So you, I, are you just to, to the, I mean, interested in the mechanics. So were you dictating it? Were you recording it, and then people uh, typed it out from that's the recording? That's right. I, yeah. I used a dictaphone. Yeah, I used a dictaphone, right. and then I had three friends do the typing. Great. Um, so that, that you know, I, I try and surround myself, and I always have done actually. Going back to those days, I described my senior leadership team at school. Surround myself with people I can trust, who I have faith in and who uh, I know will support me because I will do the same for them. Mm -hmm. uh, again, it's a two way thing. I see relationships as being very much two way things. I don't, I don't, I'm not comfortable with being totally reliant upon people, but the same rule, um, I'm also not comfortable with being someone who someone is totally reliant upon. Yes. Uh, it is, it is a, it's a mixture of the two really. And uh, you're right, I, I still feel a need to be, feel as I'm a teacher, <laughs> you know, I've got something to offer. Yeah. And um, it helps my my, my self-esteem. It helps my feel of self-worth. So what really would you if you up in the morning? If you look, take your latest book that was published last year, Dear Alzheimer's, which I think you've got a copy there that, that for people to see. Um, what, what is your hope that people would take away if they if they got a copy of Dear Alzheimer's? What, what would be what would be your hope that they would learn from reading that book? Well, the, the, the book of the book is a diary. And I deliberately did it as such because it shows readers, particularly professionals who are working in the dementia world, what someone with dementia with support can achieve. And also I was mindful of making sure I included those people who are supporting me during that journey. So it shows you what someone can do over nine years, but what they can do with support. And also it illustrates some of what was available to people and what work was going on behind the scenes to make life better for others as well. Can you give me an example of something that made your life better that you talk about in the book? Um, well, certainly the National uh, Dementia Action Alliance. There's a fair bit about that in that. The Alzheimer's Society have been a big part of my life over the years, deep and indeed linked to the book you mentioned earlier, Walk the Walk, Talk the Talk. That raised money for the Alzheimer's Society and deep. And the money that went to deep funded Philly Hare, Rosemary and myself going to the United Nations to speak to the United Nations Convention on uh, Disability of People uh, prior to the government inspection at the time. And, you know, that was a big ask and a big, uh, a big gig, really. And That's also an enormous contribution that you've made, because I know as a result of you doing that, the World Health Organization has now adopted a global dementia action plan so that every country of the world is now committed to a program of increasing awareness and understanding of dementia. And that's only because people like yourself living with dementia has been prepared to put yourself out, go to Geneva and talk to people there. So um, that's a real achievement and, and good to have been able to do that. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it means a lot to me to hear that, Jeremy, and to know that it did some good because the idea of going to Geneva was one which I had to be convinced to do because the idea of travel is challenging to me and to Rosemary. And there has to be some good to it. There has to be a purpose for it. The idea of going on a jolly or going on a trip has very little appeal to me of, of, along those lines. But what does have an appeal is to go to a place like that and then to actually try and make a difference. Yeah, and, uh, and I think seeing the results probably makes you feel more positive about what you can do, that your, your experience is making a difference for other people uh, around the world. Uh, I, I was interested in just the, the fact that you're able to continue telling your story through books. It made me, reminded me of Terry Pratchett, the, the novelist who uh, passed away, as you know, a couple of years ago from dementia. But it's interesting how dementia affects different people in different ways. So a bit like you, he could carry on writing, he could carry on thinking his, his books, but he couldn't tie his shoelaces up and he couldn't walk across a room. Uh, but so his spatial awareness went completely, but his ability to write didn't disappear. And I suppose that's a good message that everyone should recognize that dementia affects different people in different ways. Uh, and the important thing is to find out the things you can do rather than the things you can't do yeah. uh, and to, to build on those. 
and and for me, I think the two main positives around having dementia, if there are any, one is the fabulous people I've had the good fortune of meeting over the past nine years. That's professionals and other people affected by dementia, which has been absolutely amazing. And I've made some really, really good friends who, you know, are, are top draw, really. Uh, and secondly, um, my, my, though my cognitive intelligence has declined, uh, my emotional intelligence, I think, has improved. Um, I think always it was there and, and hopefully staff would endorse that. And people who have known me for many years would endorse that. Uh, they, 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 they do say that. But it was always for me, I was always the, the professional. Yeah. And many of my relationships were based upon that professional dialogue and that professional relationship. Whereas now yeah. my relationships are more personal um, yeah, that, that's and, and they're a, often that, driven that's... by they're driven by emotional intelligence. But that's a really good and positive message. And I think we're going to have to end in a moment, but I'm just squeeze in a couple of questions before we, we run out of time. Um, because I think it's always important to, to listen to what people viewing this, this program want to know about. So one, the first one I've got is from somebody called Jenny, who's asked, do you think factors like lockdown, coronavirus lockdown affect the way our brain works? I forget words and names, but I also find myself putting things in silly places. Should I go to see the doctor? Well, I'm, I'm not a medical expert, but what I would say is forgetting things isn't isn't on its own a sign of dementia. We all forget things. We all forget where we put things. We all forget names. I suppose it's changes in your your behaviour. If, if, if formerly you wouldn't have done that, and now you're doing it, maybe conversations need to be had with someone. If it's a change in your cognitive functioning, rather than something which you've perhaps had before, um, see how as we move into the new normal as well, because I'm sure this, this crazy situation we're in at the moment mm. is affecting mm. everybody's cognitive functioning. And I think it's a good message though, Keith, from your experience, is don't be afraid to go to your GP yeah. and to, afraid to go back to your GP if you still have concerns. It doesn't mean you've necessarily got dementia, but it means there's a process, as you described very well, of a series of tests and checks to yeah. make sure that they do really understand what's going on. And probably for more people than not, it would be uh, something that isn't dementia. But for some people, it is dementia. And it's better to know what you've got than not to know. Although, although the diagnosis is difficult, it's, it's, it's important to know what it is so you can deal with it. That's very Let me true. ask you a, a couple of other questions. So Leslie has asked, as a form, former head teacher, how do we increase children's understanding of dementia? It's a good question. It is a good question. And there are lots of projects out there, some of which the Alzheimer's Society are supporting, whereby intergenerational projects are, are taking place to make children aware. Our, uh, our daughter who's a deputy head. She takes her children into a care home or was doing prior to the coronavirus, of course, where the children would sing and talk with the mm. residents. And it was an enriching experience for both the older people and the children. And also, I think within the curriculum, it could be easily be part of the health education curriculum, particularly as children move into uh, into the secondary sector. Yes, well, but, but that's a good message that, that getting the contact between people in the care home and, and the young people in schools is, is really important and can make a big difference. And it's a two way learning process, as you say. Yeah. Final question, just very quickly, we're a minute over time, but I'm going to squeeze this one in because it's almost a question for Rosemary rather than yourself. Oh, right. uh, somebody called Will says he's caring for his wife who lives with dementia. Do you think family carers of people with dementia get enough support? No. <laughs> right, well, that's a good, clear answer. And probably something that we should all be picking up on and recognising that, that there are two people who are affected, as we said earlier, and thinking about the needs and support for the person who cares for someone with dementia is as important as thinking yeah. about the needs of the person with dementia. Keith, we're going to have to stop there because we're right out of time. That It's zipped by, but you've been very clear. And, and just the fact that you've talked with such clarity, I think is reassuring to so many people who are living with dementia that there are things you can still do. There are positive contributions. There are ways you can lead your life, whether it's clearing out the river or writing books or a number of different ways you can still contribute, even when, as your case, you've been living with dementia for, for almost 10 years. Uh, and I think that's a very important positive message. So thank you for being my guest this afternoon. Next week, my guest is Caroline Abrahams, the National Charity Director of Age UK. And we're gonna talk a bit about um, the experience of supporting older people generally through coronavirus uh, and prospects for the future. One of the things Age UK has been campaigning about a lot 
is the TV license charge introduced for people over 75. So I'm sure Caroline will touch on that as well as a number of different issues, uh, different issues as well. So thank you once again, Keith, and please do join me next Tuesday where my guest will be Caroline Abrahams. Have a good week until then. Thank you.